Well, everyone, we draw aside today to say goodbye to a man who is very special, to acknowledge his life and those 74 years that Wes has shared with us. Not only do we come aside to reflect, but we come aside now to make sure that his body is placed in the midst of the earth with dignity and with respect, and that we allow his spirit to go free. So for those in the chapel and those who are watching beyond, we draw aside to honour a very special and significant individual who's very precious to each of us in his own distinct way. And to sum up the reasons why we gather, I quote the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson. He summed it all up in a few words when he wrote, to laugh often and love much, to win the respect of intelligent persons and the affection of children, to earn the approval of honest critics and to endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to give oneself, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch or redeemed social condition, to have played and laughed with enthusiasm and sung with exultation, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, Wes, Wes, this is to have succeeded. And that you have. Wes, we come aside to honour your life today. Take as a sign of our love and respect not only our attendance but our words and feelings. We come aside to acknowledge all those ways in which you enriched our lives and to say thank you. But mate, now we've come to the end of the road and you must go on alone. So we gather to say you go not only with our love, but you go with our respect, our thoughts and prayers. Wes, may you rest in peace, knowing that you're greatly missed and even in death you're still deeply loved. I'd like to invite Linda to bring us the reading. Oh, sorry, Shirley, now switch script. Okay, so it's all yours. Thank you. This is called The Dash. I read a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that they spent alive on earth. And now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be arranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? I'd like to share with you some thoughts and words that have been put together and describing how Wes has used his dash. <laughs> In other words, his eulogy. So John or Wes was born at Crown Street Women's Hospital on the 4th of August in 1947 the first child of Jean and Eddie. John had two younger sisters, Sue and Shirley, who he remained very close to throughout his life. Eddie and Jean were the soul of the earth people who worked long hours to provide as much as they could for their children. John's childhood home was a small housing commission cottage at 934 Forest Road, Peakhurst, a 
across the road from the Grandview Bowling Club where his parents enjoyed playing bowls. John went to Peakhurst Primary School where he was class captain and in the choir. John enjoyed playing in the neighbourhood, emulating his childhood heroes, the Lone Ranger, Tarzan and Davy Crockett, often in the bush across the road. John's parents were not wealthy, but one of John's fondest memories at age 12 was one of the only family holidays they went on to Harrington near Taree. When John was 11, he would travel by train to the city where he worked as a lollipop boy at the St James's Picture Theatre. Now that's not one of those uh, traffic control things, that's a genuine person who sold lollipops, ice creams and, and all sorts of things. And this was where he began to learn the value of a dollar and he saved it up to buy his own bike. During his teenage years, John constantly, uh, consistently worked three jobs at a time, which included the local paper run and even used chaff bags to collect manure, which he sold to their neighbours as fertiliser for their gardens, entrepreneurial skills at an early age. John worked so hard throughout his teenage years that by the age of 17, he had saved enough to buy his own car, an FJ Holden. It's probably be worth a lot more now if he still had it. John had two near misses in his childhood, both involving his treasured bike. The first was when he had stomach pain, jumped on his bike and rode himself to the doctor who called an ambulance which took him to hospital for urgent surgery to remove his appendix just before it burst. The second inc incident was when he was riding his bike and a car collided with him in Forest Road and he spent one and a half days in a coma, fortunately making a full recovery. John attended Nawi Boys High School from 1960 to 1965 where he excelled in economics and enjoyed playing cricket, rugby league, rugby union and athletics. In later years, he had a promising rugby league career with the Kingsgrove Colts, which he enjoyed immensely, cut short by injury, therefore allowing him to focus on his career. Around this time, John developed his famous love of music. He enjoyed listening to Johnny O'Keefe, Cold Joy, Illusions, The Beatles, Elvis, The Beach Boys, Roy Orbison, Cliff Richard, to name of just a few. His extensive record collection and in latter years cassette tapes and CDs collections were absolutely epic. Upon leaving school at age 17, John started his first job at the Bank of New South Wales, which, uh, sorry, while also working the bar at the Brighton Hotel and cleaning the Bexley Hotel in the early hours of the morning. The earnings from which the, from the three jobs enabled him to buy his first block of land and then also his first home, which was on Forest Road, Peakhurst. While John was working in the bank, he became aware that there, was more, there were more opportunities in real estate and he began his real estate career at Schofield's, uh, sorry, Schofield's, is it? Schofield's. Oh, Schofield's. Oh, that's a mouthful. I do apologise to Mr. Schofield and son in Padstow in, uh, in 1969. He then took an office at CH Little Corner of Howard and Faraday Road, Chamber Fleming, Chamber Fleming Padstow Real Estate, with two partners, Don Mercer and Ken Dougal and with whom, over subsequent years, he did a number of property developments in the local area. With his drive, initiative and selling prowess, John quickly made his way forward as one of the recognised leaders in the industry, averaging in the vicinity of 20 sales a month, which was an extraordinary number and, in that respect, an extraordinary achievement. He was then approached by the professionals group for his business to become their 100th office in Sydney amid much fanfare, fanfare 
and from that time on, his office was consistently rank, ranked in the top offices in the professionals group. John built up a wide network of clients and peers who respected him immensely. And in the last two decades, he was so proud to have his three children working alongside him in the business. In his early 20s, John developed an interest in politics and found a great appeal with the Liberal Party, whose principles of free enterprise struck a chord with him. He became the first president of the Beverly Hills Young Liberals and maintained a close connection to the party for the rest of his life. John was always guided by the principle of giving back and it was a natural progression for him to seek out ways of doing that. He was drawn to the guiding principles of the Lions organisation, along with friends and acquaintances who were similarly inspired John helped to form the Lagano Lions, Lions Club as a charter member in 1973, with club members growing to 100 members in, in, in only four years. In 1982, John became president of Lagano Lions, and he was also, a fundraiser, also involved in fundraising for St Vincent's Hospital and the Victor Chang Foundation. He was also instrumental in creating a large number of charity events. Carols by Candlelight in Lugano, with his great mate Sandy Scott, Sandy performing each year, as well as Light Up Lugano, encouraging residents to get into the spirit of Christmas, which was always such a treasured time for him that time of the year. In recognition of John's tremendous contribution to Lyons and to his local and statewide community, he was awarded the Melvin Jones Award, the highest international lines recognition award. In later years, John was responsible for raising a lot of funds for the Lung, Lung Foundation as well. John met the love of his life, Joy, at a dance at the Riverley Dance Hall in Hurstville on a Sunday night in 1967. They were aged 19 and 16. It's almost illegal. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> when John saw Joy that night, he was captivated by her natural beauty and by the way she seemed to radiate happiness as well as her ever constant smile. John and Joy fell in love and were married on the 26th of September 1970 at Peakhurst Methodist Church. And they brought their first home a little one bedroom cottage at 858 Forest Road, Peakhurst that same year. John and Joy then moved to Lugano where their three children were born. Belinda Kate in 1975, Todd Wesley in 1978 and Dean Jason in 1984. Now everyone knows how old Belinda is. <laughs> these were years, these were wonderful times with the kids all attending Lagado Public School, through which John and Joy made many lifelong friends. The kids all played sport locally, with John proudly coaching several of their sporting teams. John believed in giving opportunities to his children, as he did not have himself, so he sent the kids to private schools. So Belinda went to MLC at Strathfield, Todd and Dean went to Newington College. Probably today you could have switched that around and they could have all gone anywhere they wanted to. <laughs> but anyway, the Newington years were a very enjoyable time for John. Always uh, reveling in watching all of the boys' sports matches and in the special relationship he forged over those 12 years of involvement with the school. Throughout the children's childhood, John again, uh, uh, sorry, throughout children's childhood, John again wanted to give them more than he ever had himself growing up and so he began the family tradition of school holidays away, including 12 years of Easter holidays with the Bush, Parks and Stapleton families and in January every year up to Port Stephens, shared with the Andersons, Ponty and Kearns family as well as many other close friends and family. 
the days spent out on the boat, though John loved teaching his kids to water ski and wakeboard. Other family holidays included regular snow trips, snow skiing trips, and a holiday to Fiji, and a memorable trip to Disneyland and Disney World. It was during these years, ever an entrepreneur, John had a number of different investments, some more successful than others. Two notables being building the first ever concrete batch plant in Vietnam and constructing and running the Ashfield water slides, which with the kids especially loving this last one. You can understand that you can't get much fun out of a concrete batch plant, can you? <laughs> His most enjoyable, though, proved to be the champion race hall called the named Charge Forward, who came second in the Golden Slipper in 2004. This led to a wonderful chapter of his life where he enjoyed many fun outings at the races with family and friends, plus owning several more other uh, successful racehorses. And he loved rubbing shoulders with the colorful racing identities. Other, uh, another great love of John's was his uh, St. George Dragons. I'll leave the Illawarra bit out, but anyway, it was <laughs> who he followed from his childhood. And he had the joy of experiencing 11 grand final wins in a row, featuring the likes of his favourite favourites like uh, Gaznia, Langlands, Raper and Proven. This love was passed on to his children and John loved nothing more than taking them to the games from when they were little as season ticket holders through the, to the last 10 years of becoming spo a sponsor and watching the games from a box at Jubilee Oval with family and friends. One of his greatest family memories was watching the Saints win the 2010 grand final with the whole family. In 1960, uh, sorry, 1995, John and Joy moved to Portview. This beautiful property has been the scene of so many special and happy memories in each of their lives, including birthdays, Christmas days, John's infamous annual day of days with his mates, baby showers, christenings, 18th and 21st birthdays, engagement parties, and sometimes parties just for no reason at all. But above all, family was the most important thing in John's life. He had a very special bond with his parents, Eddie and Jean, his parents-in-law, Norm and Beryl, his sisters, Sue and Shirley, and their husbands, Graham and Barry, and on Joy's side, Norm and Leonie, Bob and Barb. This ex extended through to John's nieces, nephews, his children's, uh, children's in-laws and all the extended family. John Wes had a wide variety and circle of friends who he loved dearly and were each a very important and very special part of his life. John was overjoyed to see his three children marry, Todd to Tamara in 2004, Belinda to Christian in 2011 and Dean to Brittany in 2016 and enjoyed a wonderful close relationship with Tamara, Christian and Britt. One of the special periods of John's life was when he became a grandfather. Zara, Taylor, Sia, sorry. Taya and Sia. Oh, I'm sorry, Taya and Sia. Uh, Cooper, Hunter, Ruby, Luna and Hux Wesley lit up his life and he enjoyed nothing more than spending time with them. Having them at Portview with him and Nanny watching all their sporting matches and giving them grandfatherly advice and love. This love was returned tenfold by his beautiful grandchildren who cherished their time with Poppy. Following his double lung transplant, John spent his twilight years enjoying all the things he loved and spending time with his beautiful wife, Joy, his children, his grandchildren and his dear friends, all of whom he cherished more than life itself. And to conclude, this reflects the reason why he will be 
deeply missed. Well, just to continue to paint the picture for us and to bring us their reflections, it's over to Belinda Todd and Dean. speech 43 years in the making comes down to this and I know there is no way I can do my father justice the 10 minute eulogy you just heard we could have gone for an hour and still not got to the exciting bits my father sucked the marrow out of life he constantly sought knowledge and new experience and I'm truly blessed to have had him as my father guiding my footsteps what is the measure of a man the measure of a man is in the lives he's touched. The outpouring of grief and love and support since Dad's passing has been something extraordinary, and I must thank all of you for that. I think I took for granted the effect he had on people. Well, he was my dad after all, but the last week has reminded me just how special everyone thought he was. He connected with all types of people of all ages and from all walks of life. This was not forced, but something so innate and so natural to him that it is hard to comprehend. I received an extraordinary amount of messages this week from my friends that said he was always up for a chat, but importantly, also interested in what they had to say. And many commented that they looked to his life as an inspiration and used the advice that he happily gave them to guide their own. Also in the last week, a number of people have said how Dad is a very unique individual. And so I've been wondering about this. What makes an 11-year-old boy who was given nothing and was never going to be given anything realise that he wants his life to be different? And then to have the belief that it is actually possible to change that life. It is that boy's will. And I think that this is the defining characteristic of my father's success in life. And so began an amazing journey, an amazing story of that boy rising from housing commission in Pecos to one of the most beautiful homes in the Shire and the rich tapestry of stories and the will that got him there. As most of you know, Dad had a double lung, lung transplant five and a half years ago. It is extraordinary that he got through this. He was in and out of hospital for six months, mainly in, and there was a couple of times where, we, where he was absolutely gone. I know a few of you visited and thought it might even be goodbye. But again, his will, his thirst for life, and he amazingly rose again. He stopped working, finally, and the man we thought could never change did. And his relationships with his family evolved into something softer and greater. And now that he had the gift of life, what he gave us now was the gift of time, and he spent that time with us. So we have to look at his passing as not too sudden or too soon, but more like his life had bonus years. Years to spend with his friends who he loved and who loved him, and years to see his grandkids. Some to be born, and the others to grow to an age where they will remember him and appreciate the person that he was. And no one deserves that more than this man. He used to say to me, there is no such thing as luck, Todd. You make your own. And he lived this mantra. Nothing came easy. He just worked his ass off. But he did have one huge stroke of luck in his life. And that was being at that hotel that night when mum walked in. A 51-year marriage between two very different people that when they came together made an unstoppable combination I know he credited mum for a lot of his success. He knew he couldn't have done it without her. And I just want to assure him now that myself, my beautiful wife Tamara, and our three daughters will be here for her forever. And I know I speak on that for Dean's and Belinda's families and everyone else listening today also. He lived his life at a furious pace and he had a laser focus. He was driven to provide for his family and to give us all the things that he never had. But at the same time, he somehow managed to keep us level and not spoil us. 
which I think in some ways is his greatest gift to us and has set us on the right paths in our lives. I have so many memories, so many funny stories of the crazy, vibrant, infectious person that he was, which I will share with you all when I actually see you. Again, no time for all those stories today, but we will definitely celebrate his life in a better way than this when we are able to in a few months' time. For now, my grief and sadness and regret for words unsaid is overwhelming. I've always had a spark in me, no doubt another gift from him, but it is now guttering, burning low. I have to believe that it will flame again. I know he would want nothing else. My last word is to his eight grandkids, who I think gave him as much pleasure as anything in his life. Zara, Taya and Sia, Cooper, Hunter and Ruby, Luna and Hux. You have his blood and spirit in you. And that means for you in your lives, anything is possible. Love you, Dad. Well, that's why I wanted to go first. <laughs> Dad, or big ways to his friends. And when I think about it, this might have been confusing when you first met him because he wasn't that big in stature. But it was after getting to know him that Big's Wes suited him to a T. Dad taught me that life is not black and white. To live in the grey and no can always mean yes if you're willing to make it so. This included when I was 12 years old and I was in London sightseeing with mum and dad. We were on a, a tour bus, as you do, and one of the stops was Lord's Cricket Ground. We, took, we got out to take some photos and coincidentally there was, a game of, there was a test match on and Dad thought, what a great opportunity to see a game of cricket on the hallow pitch of Lords. We had no tickets and totally the wrong dress because um, as you know there is tight dress regulations at Lords. This didn't phase him the slightest. He walked up and started talking to a security guard on the front door. The security guard was kind of perplexed <laughs> that this strange talking Aussie was serious about coming in with no tickets and initially just nose and initially just shut it down. No, you can't enter here. It's a sold out event. At this point, it is safe to say I was pretty embarrassed and just faded back into the background as as, as I did in these occasions with Dad. <laughs> and it was many occasions. Uh, where am I? Fuck I've lost my <laughs> But after a few moments later, uh, I didn't know, uh, so, sorry, sorry, I faded back into the corner, so I don't know exactly what was said. But a few moments later, we're on a fully guided tour of the members facility, followed by sitting in the sun watching an afternoon of England take on the West Indies. Dad, I want to promise you to pass on uh, to my kids your life lessons, being that family is above all else, actions speak louder than words, to remain humble, hard work will always trump talent, and to never give up. Oh, and of course, I'll be sure to pass on to Huxley the advice you gave me on my wedding day. She's always right. <laughs> we would like to thank you for fighting so hard for these last five years. It was so special to Britt and I to watch you build a relationship with Luna and that you met our son, Hux Wesley. I know they will both carry a piece of you in their heart forevermore. Not a day will go by that I'll not think of you to smile, cry, or just be thankful for what you have done for us. Before I sign off, I want to make one last promise to you, Dad, that your darling wife, our mother dearest, will never walk alone. We will be by her side every step of the way. <sighs> Dad, you came from nothing and gave us everything. I will always remember you as my mentor, my hero. Sorry, <laughs> my dad, and the stores, but ah. <laughs> lastly, thank you to everyone watching um, for all their love and support to our family over these last um, week and a half. It's been incredible, and I'm forever grateful. What a life.
what a life our dad lived and how bloody perfectly he managed to embody that work hard, play hard motto. Dad moved himself from his beginnings in a cosy housing commission cottage in Peakhurst to the beautiful sandstone port view on Gunnamatta Bay in Barrenee. So many have asked me over the years how Dad achieved this, and I'll tell you. He boasted an incredibly sharp mind, fierce drive and determination, an unwavering strength and force of will, and also a genuine love of people from all walks of life. Dad would never take no for an answer. <laughs> he would negotiate until that no became a yes. <laughs> the squeaky door, he used to call it. <laughs> if he wanted something, he made it happen. And yes, of course, there was some healthy ego sometimes driving him, but more than anything, he wanted to create a life for us filled with all the things that he never had growing up. He was especially proud of being able to give Todd, Dean and I a private school education. He had hopes of each of us becoming lawyers and doctors. <laughs> but we'd grown up listening to him on the phone, negotiating sales and looking after his clients. Real estate was in our blood. Anyone who knows Dad closely will know he was incredibly frugal. He was actually renegotiating his electricity bill just the week before last. He didn't waste money, he worked his butt off. Six days a week when we were growing up and he saved hard. <laughs> Eight days a week is what he used to tell us, that's right, Dean. He taught, us, he taught us the value of hard work and he pushed us hard. I started working in the business with him at age 15 and except for a few years while I was at uni, I spent many years working alongside him. If I arrived even a minute after 8 a.m., I would get a phone call. He was tough. <laughs> but he knew he was helping us to build a strong work ethic, resilience and strength. At age 21, he told us we had to buy a house or start paying board. We each bought a house, something I'm incredibly grateful for today. Dad and my relationship was colourful. <laughs> Dad liked to control things and I didn't like to be controlled. <laughs> we were so alike, both incredibly strong-minded and stubborn, and we both also loved to party. And it was these three qualities that had us butting heads hard over the years. But also, Dad loved to party himself and celebrate life. Our growing up was filled with parties, with Dad on his lager stick, his mates on guitar, music, singing and dancing. And he also loved nothing more than hanging out and partying with us and our friends. Being so alike, Dad and I also deeply understood each other. And I'm so grateful for how our relationship and love for each other evolved over the years. Five years ago, following Dad fighting for his life after his double lung transplant, he just never came back into the office. It was the strangest thing but also a beautiful blessing. Something we could never have imagined happened. He began to relax, well, as much as Wes could relax. <laughs> and he softened, not completely, but he did soften. He knew he'd been given a second chance. <sighs> and in our hearts, we knew this too. His relationship with each of us changed. He was no longer our boss, but just Dad and Poppy. Like most men, he initially struggled with that change in life, but over time he reveled in it. And in these precious years, he genuinely cherished his time spent with his and Mum's wide circle of dear and close friends, with our beautiful extended families, with Mum, and each of us, but especially with his grandchildren, who each brought so much love and joy to his life. Mum. How he adored you. 
He held you on a pedestal. <laughs> he could not... <laughs> He could not have achieved all that he did without you by his side. He knew that. We all knew that. You shared a love together that most people can only dream of. From when you fell in love with him at age 16 to then share over 51 years of marriage together. It was a relationship of genuine love and affection. I admired so much how close you were to each other. It always brought me joy seeing you still holding hands and cuddling each other after all those years. And right now, I know your heart is completely broken, but as I promised Dad only a couple of months ago, that if he were to go first, that Todd, Dean and I and our families would look after you for him, and we will. We will. When I look at Todd, Dean and I, I see so much of Dad in each of us, and now also strong character traits that I notice of him in each of his grandchildren. In my own children, I see his strength in Ruby, his incredibly sharp intellect in Cooper, and his, and his unwavering, strong and adventurous spirit in Hunter. <laughs> his traits that I'm honoured to carry on will be his incredible strength, his joy in helping others, and his overwhelming passion of and love for life. And I guess that's something that I wanted to ask of each of you today. We feel so grateful and comforted to have had such an outpouring of love sent to us since last Monday. We've loved reading each of your stories about Dad and the ways in which he had an influence or an impact on your lives. And today I ask each of you, what will be the way that you can carry on Dad's legacy for him? I'm so grateful for all that Dad taught us, but more so for every moment I got to share with him. He was such a vibrant, larger than life person and a loving and beautiful dad to us. Dad, I know how proud you were of each of us and we will each continue to make you proud for the rest of our lives. We know your strong spirit will live on on in each of us and of each of those, in each of those who knew you and loved you. Right now, I can't imagine our life without you. We know you would be saying, just get on with it. (laughs) And get on with it, we will. We will live it to the full, Wesley. We will soak up every single beautiful moment just like you did. Rest in peace now, Dad. We've got it from here. just to reinforce all those words said with feelings and tears and smiles but we're also now going to uh, reinforce them with some images scenes from Wes's life so no doubt this will bring back a few memories with a tear and a smile but here we go everyone
want to pray a thanksgiving for Wes's life. Creator God, source of life, we give you thanks for the gift of this man. And as we have reviewed his life, give thanks for his qualities, his skills, his love, his affection, his loyalty, and everything that he's done to contribute to our happiness and well-being. So, Lord God, source of life, we commend him to you with all our love. We ask you to love him in the same ways that we love him, address his needs in the same way that we wish, and in the midst of our sorrow, visit us with your light and peace as well. He has left us with profound lessons. He has taught us about love and what it is to work hard, what it is to be consistent but caring, approachable and fun. For all these things, we are truly grateful. In the name of the Christ, we pray and humbly recall the words that Jesus taught his disciples to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Hi, everyone. All I can say is just remember... Love does not stop at the funeral, okay? And there are going to be times you're going to miss him and yearn for him so deeply and feel your heart's going to break. Please look after yourselves. Just remember that all those feelings don't... They're not a sign that you're crazy, just a sign that you're a very normal, warm, loving human being. And uh, in lots of ways, there's a bit of him imprinted on every one of your lives. So we've got a wonderful legacy, and in that respect, it's a great thing that he has achieved in the successive generations that reflect back upon his life. So everyone, we will now adjourn to the graveside, but I understand you want to place flowers, so let's do so now. <laughs>